All right, so President McKinley is deliberately going to uh, squelch reports of the atrocities as well as because he needed to win the election. And unfortunately for him, as he won the election, he will be assassinated precisely because of the U.S. role and the U.S. imperialism. Uh, um, but nonetheless, <clears throat> historian uh, uh, Howard Zinn relays it that there was a heated debate in the United States about whether or not to take the Philippines. And as one story has it, President McKinley is going to tell a group of Christian ministers visiting the White House how he came to his decision to invade the Philippines. And this is apparently what he said. I thought that first we would only take Manila, then Luzon, then other islands perhaps also. I walked the floor of the White House night after night after night until midnight, and I am not ashamed to tell you, gentlemen, that I went down on my knees and prayed Almighty God for light and guidance more than one night. And one night late it came to me this way. I don't know how it was, but it came. That we could not give them back to Spain. That would be cowardly and dishonorable. That we could not turn them over to France or Germany, our commercial rivals in the Orient. That would be bad business and discreditable. That we could not leave them to themselves. They were unfit for self-government. And they would soon have anarchy and misrule over there, worse than Spain's was. And there was nothing left for us to do but to take them all and to educate the Filipinos and uplift and civilize and Christianize them and by God's grace do the very best we could by them as our fellow men from whom Christ also died. And then I went to bed and went to sleep and slept soundly. Obviously, Emilio Aguinaldo and the Filipinos did not get the same message from God as did McKinley. U.S. historians call their fight for independence an insurrection. But nonetheless, <clears throat> one of the things that the United States needed was a government to uh, <clears throat> run the country on behalf of the United States. So an elite class of Filipinos, also known as pensionados, are going to be allowed to come to the United States to learn in American universities. And in November 1903, 103 pensionados became the first Filipino students in American universities and campuses. And in the early 1900s, other Filipinos are going to be arriving to the, to the United States via Hawaii. First, they're going to go to Hawaii because they're going to be part of contract laborers to work on sugar cane plantations. And the whole idea is they're seeking a better life in America simply because the United States has now colonized the Philippines. Filipinos came to the west coast of the United States as uh, cheap labor. They worked many long hours on farms in the agricultural fields, picking grapes, asparagus, lettuce, and other fruits and vegetables in places like Hayward or Salinas, Stockton, El Centro, and even in Escondido. In Alaska and Seattle, they worked in the fish canneries. And if they were not working the fields, then they were working as dishwashers, waiters, and busboys. Now, students, you are reading a book uh, on the Latino experience uh, by, uh, by Juan Gonzalez, and Juan Gonzalez is sharing with you that the reason why many Latinos are in the United States is because of U.S. imperialism and U.S. foreign policy in Central America and the Caribbean. Well, likewise, the reason why there's Asians in the United States is primarily because of U.S. imperialism and foreign policy in the Pacific Islands and in the Philippines in this particular case. So the first Filipino workers coming to the United States uh, are going to be the pioneers known as the Manong generation. Since most of them came from specific places such as Ilocor Sur, Iloilo, and Cavite in the Philippines. So Manong is a term that's in reference to elders. And as Adelaida Castillo Shuchida writes in her work on Filipino migrants in San Diego, many of them did not plan to reside permanently in the United States. All they wanted was to accumulate as much wealth as possible within a short time and return to the islands as rich men. 
But due to the low paying jobs the migrants obtained, a trip home became more and more remote as the years went by. Now throughout the 1920s and 1930s, the ratio of men was t uh, to women was 20 to 1. And in some places it was 40 to 1. But because they were Filipino, they were not allowed to marry white women. And in the state of California, the local authorities imposed anti-miscegenation laws on Filipinos. So if Filipinos did want to marry, they had to drive out of state in order to marry white women. And during this time, particularly in the 1920s through the Great Depression, white Americans are going to claim that Filipinos brought down the standard of living because they worked for low wages. We're going to view a documentary uh, on the Manong generation entitled Remembering Our Manongs. And it is a documentary film exploring the history of the earliest Filipino immigrants in Sonoma County. Mostly single young men began arriving in California uh, during, uh, at the turn of the century, but primarily in the 1920s. Now the film is going to be produced by the Filipino American National Historical Society, the Sonoma County chapter, and is co-sponsored by the California Council for the Humanities. So let's go and listen and learn and understand and appreciate the Manong generation. <laughs> Sonoma County, California, renowned wine country and gateway to the Redwood Empire. Each year, thousands of visitors are drawn here to enjoy stunning views and world-class wines. But nearly a century ago, 100 young men from half a world away were drawn here for different reasons. Little did they know of the harsh realities awaiting them or the bonds that would see them through. On a busy street, not far from Santa Rosa's scenic wine country, a modest building sits. An indistinct backdrop, it goes unnoticed by most passers-by. Yet for some, this small slice of real estate was once a dream come true, a well-earned reward for Sonoma County's earliest Filipino immigrants. It was a one-story building when they first purchased it. It was very sacred to them, and it was a gift to us. That was very forward-looking on their part to want to have something, um, a piece of land and, and a building to signify their presence in Sonoma County. They began arriving in the 1920s as nationals of a U.S. colony, young Filipinos were encouraged by American mentors to come to the U.S. Here, they were told, democracy reigned and opportunities were plentiful. It wasn't a hard sell. Most were from poor farming barrios in the Philippine countryside. Opportunities were few. To help support families, many had quit school in order to work. He told me that he saw his life being one of riding the caribou in the rice paddies. Things were tough in the Philippines, and what he was told was that he would have an opportunity to become an American, become a citizen, and to, you know, to make money, and to uh, move up and have a lot of opportunities in life. Still, the Filipino's strong ties back home made leaving difficult. In his oral memoir, Early Immigrant, Philip Vera Cruz described the importance of family and community bonds. Back home, the idea of the extended family even goes beyond the family to the community and becomes a very good attitude of community consciousness, helpfulness, understanding, and loyalty. Oh yes, these are the better traits that we Filipinos brought with us from the Philippines. Young Innocent Uesuelo had a unique bond. He and his childhood sweetheart, Felisa, planned to marry. Determined to provide well for his future bride, Asuelo left home to seek his fortune in America. Like Asuelo, thousands of young men, most in their late teens, left behind all they knew to journey to America. Some came by way of Hawaii, where they worked in sugarcane and pineapple fields. 
Viewed by Hawaiian landowners as an inexpensive and docile labor force, young Filipino men were heavily recruited from the rural provinces. It was the Hawaiian plantations needing laborers. And so they, they said the Philippines has a well-developed um, sugarcane industry and therefore why don't we just import laborers from the Philippines? Others sailed directly to the mainland, all with high hopes. Grandpa tells a story about they put them in the basement or the, the hulk of the ship and kept these guys down there all the way to America for weeks and so they didn't see sunlight. And he talks about basically being cramped with hundreds of other Minongs and landing in Seattle. For most, this was the first time away from home. With few English skills and limited funds, they landed at ports along the West Coast. John Galimba Jr. recalls his father's story. His mother, all she gave him was uh, like a dozen hard-boiled eggs. So he ate that on the boat on, on the way over here. He was uh, 1928, he landed in Long Beach. He was 17 years old. Didn't speak a word of English. There was a lot of uh, his town mates and cousins he came with, and he ended up uh, just doing whatever he could to survive. It wasn't uncommon for newcomers to run into town mates in the places where Filipinos gathered, and true to homeland tradition, they looked out for one another, creating their own sense of family and community in the new country. Ken Tapone recalls the story of his father, Nick. He had a friend, uh, Terry Tolentino, in Oakland. And if anybody could find him a job, Terry could find him a job. So he packed up and he set sail for uh, Oakland and found him at a local restaurant. Terry said, take my job. I thought that was pretty amazing, but that's what happened. Others, like John Mejia Sr., were not as lucky. His uncle was supposed to meet him at the, at the boat. His uncle never showed up. So there was a man getting people to go work in Montana. He needed a job. He, needed, he had no money. So they put him into rail cars, and they went right away to Montana. He went out there, and they gave him their, their food for the day. Basically, it was one meal. And he was so hungry, he hadn't eaten. So he, he went into the bushes and just ate his food, just ate all of it. And so at lunchtime, um, he had no food, and he was still hungry, and everyone else sat down and started eating, and so I, he, I remember him telling me he went into a, into a ravine and just cried. That's how he came to the U.S. A common goal was to earn enough money to support families back home and eventually return to the islands. Some planned to continue their educations in the U.S. But America's welcome was clearly conditional, leading only to the lowest paying jobs where cheap labor was needed. The path to economic growth, cultural assimilation, and other opportunities was rigorously blocked. Even college-educated professionals found most doors closed to them in America. Again, uh, we can appreciate something with regards to the Filipino experience.